Hey biggies and welcome to the Craft Beer Channel. And quite possibly the biggest thing I think we've ever done. We're on a mission to keep Carscale alive. And over the next five episodes, we're gonna be exploring the people and the places that make this beer scene amazing. And all that's to inspire you to either drink more Carscale or to start drinking this wonderful way of presenting both traditional and modern craft beer. Cheers. Cheers. Carscale is the lifeblood of the British beer industry and a vital part of our country's culture. It was only a few decades ago that it was all we drank in our pubs, but in the last decade or so it's been in serious, sometimes double-digit decline. The closure of our beautiful pubs and increasingly tight margins in beer all play their part, but there's also been a drop-off in interest in Carscale, especially among younger generations. Its reputation has been damaged by cliches about who drinks it and quality issues related to how hard it is to brew well and serve right. But after eight years of exploring the brewing world, we've come to believe that Carscale at its best is the ultimate way to enjoy beer. We've fallen in love with our traditional pubs, styles, breweries and culture and hate to see it slowly falling apart. So we've decided to do something about it. In a bid to ensure its survival, we've teamed up with Fuller's Brewery and spent the last six months filming stories that we hope will inspire people to get out there and drink Carscale more often. In episode one, we're looking at the situation Carscale is in and the serious business of caring for it. Carscale is a living thing, still conditioning when it's sent out to the pubs, and it needs a lot of knowledge, experience and patience to be served at its best. To learn about that, we visit the Old Fountain in East London. After a swift drink and a chat at one of our favourite Carscale pubs in the world, the Southampton Arms. This is all incredibly exciting, Johnny, but we should probably define what Carscale actually is. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be really complicated, but it's dead simple. Carscale is just a format. Right. You know, it doesn't say anything about the beer itself. It's about how it's being served at the end. So keg beer is made at a brewery. It's shipped to the pub. You put it on, it's force carbonated already, and you just open the tap and out it comes. Carscale, it's shipped to the, to the pub before it's finished. Yes. It sits in the cellar, uh, it carbonates, it conditions, and it's served at its absolute peak. So as soon as the beer's ready, it's hand pulled up. So it's literally pumped up from the cellar and out into the glass, fresh, unpasteurized, barely finished, fully fermenting. So it, it's, like, it's like the warm bread of beer. It is served as soon as it's ready. It's the best possible freshest beer experience you could ever exactly. hope to have. Freshness is the key thing. It doesn't get fresher than Carscale, or at least it shouldn't get fresher than Carscale, because there's a huge issue that comes with that, and that is the monumentally short shelf life and the difficulty that it is that you find in trying to serve it right, so caring for it in the cellar. So much trust is put in the public in, so much work has gone into it with the brewery to make sure that it's sent to them at the right time, and so it actually means that cask ale is very, very hard to get right. So if cask is beer, it's absolutely freshest. Why is it struggling? It's a great question. So of course we have issues with quality, which we've mentioned, that really short shelf life. But it's also because of those issues with quality, it's gained a reputation for being warm and flat, which is the cliche, you know, if you're not from Britain, that's probably what you think of car scale. It's also got issues in terms of its kind of perception. So it's seen as consumed by, by the older generation, an older generation that is, you know, sadly starting to die out, which is another reason why there's fewer people drinking it. And it's not managing to capture the hearts and the minds of younger generations, of more diverse populations. And then finally, there's a pricing issue. You know, the average price of a keg beer in the UK is somewhere just below five quid. For a cask beer, it's just below four quid. So you've got this really hard thing to make, really hard thing to care for, less popular product, 
and you're getting less money over the bar for every pint you sell. So the, the odds are stacked against cask. So if our mission is to keep cask beer alive, Johnny, what's our next move? I mean, there's obviously lots of sort of political and campaigning stuff that we can do to get better pricing, um, to increase quality. And there's lots of people doing that really, really well at the moment. And we support them at the Craft Beer Channel. But the thing that we could do, you, me, everyone at home, is drink more cask ale, right? And the way that we're going to convince people to do that is by telling the incredible stories, the incredible history, and the incredible future that cask ale has and should have. And that's the aim of this documentary. So in a way, the story of cast beer is only just beginning when it leaves the brewery. Yeah, absolutely. And so we're going to be telling that next chapter in this episode as we visit one of the best cast scale pubs in the country and indeed the place where the Craft Beer Channel started. Amazing. So here we are back where it all started, Bradley, eight years ago at the old fountain in Old Street. It's amazing, man. Like, for us, this is hallowed grounds. <laughs> um, well, the shady corner over there is the hallowed ground. That was it. That's, that's, where, we... where, that's where the plaque will go. Ah, oh, exactly. <laughs> the blue park. <laughs> but, you know, it is, you know, I was drinking cask ale beforehand, but this is where I came for great cask. Which is yeah. why we picked this place to be. I honestly think it instilled a kind of love in cask and our sort of working relationship together. Absolutely, yeah. So we've come back here to talk about uh, kind of the challenges of presenting cars, serving cars from the other side of the bar. So we're not talking about pricing, that kind of stuff. We're gonna talk about literally what it takes to look after a cask beer compared to a keg beer and the love, the passion, the time, and the knowledge and experience that has to go into making sure that a pint looks like this. Oh. Looks like this, which is a beautiful pint. So we're gonna to chat to Johnny, who's the manager here and he's been here for a long time, serving us up many uh, a beer and a burger over, over the years. Um, and we're gonna go down into the, another bit of hallow ground, which is the beautiful cellar. So I'm behind the bar of my favourite pub in the world, which is a bit of a novelty. It's very exciting. Um, I apologise for the things I did on that side. Um, Johnny, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, nice, nice to be here. I want to start with, with talking about the beautiful history of this pub, because you guys are right on Silicon Roundabout. Yeah. You know, this up and, well, I'd say up and coming. It's, it is, it's arrived. It's incredibly modern, but this pub has been here for decades, cent centuries? I think the building is nearly 200 years old. Good and Lord. I think for most of that, it's been used as a pub. Mm -hmm. And then the family who own it are now in their fourth generation. They've been involved with it for 60 years. Wow. Freehold for the last 16. Right. So the ability to pour their own beers and own the whole, yep. whole space. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was half owned by the church and half owned by Whitbread up until yeah, 15, 16 years ago. And then Jim Durrant bought the Freehold back then. And David Durrant now. Uh, owns it and I've been here five years running it for that family. Amazing. Now t tell me how important do you think it is that places like this still exist and in particular in in these places because you don't see many old boozers like this anymore. I'd be heartbroken if these kind of places didn't exist. Uh, they're true everyman pubs I feel or that's certainly what we try to be. Mm -hmm. um, obviously with more craft and cask leanings these days than in the, in the distant past. But yeah, uh, I feel like it's a place where you get all walks of life. Uh, it's independent and I think that shows, or it, we hope it does. Um, and it's a point of difference to so many chains. A cask is my first love. Uh, there's nothing finer to me than a, a fresh, good pint of cask, um, given everything that goes into it before you serve it and mm -hmm. afterwards. Uh, it's you know a traditional drink, it's got a long history. Um, and I think you can taste all that in a decent pint of it. Um, it's something, something worth protecting as well. Like, does it feel absolutely. like keeping that is a, to some element, there's a protection? It's certainly, to it. you know, it's got much harder, obviously, yeah, even before COVID, the drop off, the move from cask to keg was apparent here. Even though we were famed for our ale selection, we felt like a lot of people come here for the ale and still do. The switch, uh, you know, the shift from cask to keg definitely was happening in the two or three years before uh, COVID happened. And then obviously in COVID, 
with the nature of having to look after the beer, having to turn over the beer, you know, we had to bring our range right down, but I'm hopeful of getting back. It certainly feels in the first instances of, of people coming back to the pub that people are hungry to drink good cask. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I think there's even fewer places to do that now because it is a bigger risk. Uh, but we'll certainly be taking that risk because you know, we want to serve the best cask and bring people in to drink it. Why, why do you think cask scale has you know, gone into such decline? There's too many people not looking after it and serving bad, bad beer, um, not delivering it in the way that it should be. Uh, I don't think there's enough people in working in the business that are that infused about it. I, I, it's always a pleasure when I get a new member of staff who really loves cask. But I think with all the big flavours that keg beers offer and all that kind of thing, you know, the wow factors beers and all that kind of stuff, that draws people in. Um, you know, lager is still the dominating factor in things. The people that are shifting from lager to pale ales, maybe one day they'll get there and, you know, appreciate all the subtleties and traditions of a, mm. of a cask pale ale over a keg one. So there's definitely stories to tell and we really hope that we're going to be telling those throughout this series. But what I'd love to do is to go down into the cellar now and have a chat about the main issue that cask really has, which is how difficult it is to, to get right uh, and how much work there is to do to sort of rescue that reputation and say, at its best, there isn't a better way to present. Certainly British styles and like you say, maybe you know, American styles, Belgian styles, German styles can all be done right on cask when Absolutely. somebody cares about it in the cellar. So uh, yeah, let's go take a look at that and see uh, what it takes to produce a great pint of cask ale over the bar. Watch out for the low sip. Yeah. So here we are, the cold room. Ta-da! Tell me about your, about your back troubles, Johnny. My back troubles? <laughs> this is My quite low. So we're down in a pretty historic cellar. It feels like it's, it's, got, had, it's seen some things. I reckon it probably has done. <laughs> some of which I wouldn't want to know about, but yeah, there's less beer in it now than there used to be. Right, so you, you've seen that decline starting to happen. Yeah, I've been here almost five years now, and the first two winters I think I worked here at Christmas time, we were getting through maybe 30 firkins a week of various ales. Walking in here, you were like, there's not much room for anything other than, there was a walkway, yeah. and that's it. And that's it. Beer ever. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're in the, the cask, the racking area, as, Indeed. It's, as it's kind of known. Yep. T tell me about the process, you know, from, from the arrival of the beer to the moment you put it on and, and sort of how it differs to keg beer. So obviously they, both, they all get dropped through the hatch, uh, but the casks need to be put on the racks for at least a day. Uh, it depends on, you, you get to know breweries that each beer is different and some beer is much easier to keep than others. Mm -hmm. Some breweries, for instance, you know you're going to need, need to leave it on the rack for at least two days, which is generally what's accepted. Everything's settling out from that big drop. Is it carbonating in there? Is it conditioning like flavour-wise? It's, it's settling. For, that's the main, the main reason that we're uh, giving them a bit of time on the rack to let the yeast and whatever else is in there sink. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you vent it, secondary fermentation is happening. Flavors are developing. So, what's the venting process? Uh, a little wooden spile, uh, a soft spile. There's one, uh, one in here. Yeah. Juicing away there from uh, it's a Tring Ridgeway bitter that was vented last night. So yeah, that allows you know excess gas, excess beer to come out as well and let the beer breathe. If that stops bubbling fairly quickly, we shove a tap in it. And then obviously we don't put it on straight away unless it's tasting. So you're, it you're, you're watching that bubble away and kick off and then you're waiting for it to settle and then you're like, yeah, that means it's ready. So Ansbach and Hot Day beers, for instance, they tend to have a much higher level of carbonation, I would say. Uh, so they tend to take a, 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 bit a lot venting. more venting. Yeah. Um, but they're still, you know, once you, get to, once you get to know a brewery and a brewery is consistent, so it's a bit like, you know, the breweries obviously have their personalities, they're made up of people, but the, the beers kind of do as Absolutely. well. Some are fussy and some are Absolutely. just raring to get. Yeah, and it is, uh, obviously, it's a labour of love for me. So you get to know the beers mm -hmm. uh, and you tell the other people that you work with what these beers tend to behave like. Obviously, every now and again, you might get one that doesn't behave as it should. But some of the beers we keep here, Oakham Citra, uh, the Tring beers, uh, Ansbach and Hobbs, they, they seem very consistent as to you know what to expect, so that makes your job of looking after it as much easier, even though there's still a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you say it gets much easier, but compared to a keg beer which arrives, you yeah. tap it, you go, it's an yeah. entirely different world because this beer is, sure. is, is living. Absolutely, uh, and I think it should be treated with the love and respect uh, that it deserves. 
if it's a new beer that you don't know, you know, checking on it every hour, if not every half hour, you know, seeing, because I hate overventing a beer, you know, I want it to be coming out bang on for those so first if you months. overvent it, you'll start to lose the carbonation again? You'll start again. to lose some of the carbonation, the head retention is going to go down, um, the flavours already will start to be waning, I mm -hmm. think, you know, you're not going to get that mouthfeel uh, that you want from a, a, an ideal first pint out of the cask, you know. So you're sort of waiting for that moment when you're like, no, that's that's where I want it to be. Yeah. It's boom, get it on. Yeah. Get it or out. I'd rather put it on just before it's ready. Right. Because you know that it's going to, you know. Yeah. So that's the other thing. You know, throughput is super important. You've got a, what 48 hours, maybe 72, if you're very lucky, to get this beer in and out. Again, I might upset a few people here, but some of the breweries these days they make beer so well, and if you're looking after it well, it will still Even be longer. tasting good longer than three days. Right, well. Yeah. We, we've really narrowed down the selection. We used to have on eight ales. And when people come in and moan that I've only got two on, I'll say, would you rather have two banging beers on in Great Nick, or I could have four on in Average Nick? Yeah. I know what I'd rather drink. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, most uh, people understand that. Yeah. And, and on that note, I know what I'd rather drink, and that is beautiful, <laughs> delicious, perfectly fresh cask beer. So I think it's time we go upstairs and we have a couple of pints and see if your, your philosophy's working. Amen. I'm about to tap a cask, which is a very bad idea, Bradley. So, so what we're doing like there'll only be four on today. At the, uh, with two of our favorite pubs in the world, maybe two of the best cask ale pubs in the world. But we've been talking about the challenges that cask ale faces. For the rest of this season, we are gonna be talking about the absolute joy that can be found when cask is done right. So we're gonna be looking at the beautiful history of real ale. We're gonna be looking at the incredible future of cask ale. We're gonna be looking at the future of pubs, and we're gonna be looking at one beautiful beer that brings all of that together to explain why cask ale, real ale, and all the culture that surrounds it is worth fighting for. So we'll see you next week at Hook Norton.